Bible to preach a sermon, you can preach a theologically correct or doctrinally correct sermon, but more than likely, even though the word's powerful and anointed, I understand you, you tend to stir intellect, make people think, and I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but man, if you preach out of what you've seen and what you live and what you experience, it carries a different weight, and it has the ability to go in the heart and illuminate the hearing heart the same way you're illuminated. You see what I'm saying? So it's just really important, never just try to be a Bible teacher. Be in love with Jesus and gain God experience in your life and live in relationship and then speak out of that place. Amen? It's just important. Just That's not what I'm teaching on today. That just, just She just blessed us and I just thought I'd say that. So thank you, honey. Yeah. All right. There's two things I want to accomplish this morning. It's my last session with you guys. And uh, it's been fun. It goes fast. I, I, yeah. I don't know if it went fast for you, but boy, it went fast for me this week. Uh, there's two things in my heart, and the one, I don't usually do it much anymore, but we're really going to talk about healing a little bit today, and just talk about some scripture to, yeah, just to get faith in our hearts, so that we can all stay, man, it's just neat to have a crowd this big, if I can preach something and get that thing in you to where it's a seed in you, and you can have a foundation to spring from, and, and a truth to grow into. You got to understand that we're growing into Him in all things. So just because something doesn't work the way you were praying doesn't mean it's still not true. If you find it in Jesus' life and you can see it in Jesus' life, then you see the Father. So you know the will of of God through Jesus' life. So you take something you saw and you pray and it doesn't work out the way you saw it in Jesus' life. Don't change the truth. He's the truth. Don't let your experience or your lack of experience change what he did and what he said. You've got to let that be paramount. That's locked in. So we're growing into him in all things. You follow what I'm saying? So a lot of people are letting life define God. Jesus' life already did define God. You don't find God through the way life works out. You find God through his son. When you see him. You've already seen the Father. So you can't say, well, because this didn't happen and this, God must. And you know, God must be. And all of a sudden, we have all these spiritual analogies trying to explain the outcome and define God in the process. And then we never know where we're coming or going. We're always letting life decide who God is in the moment instead of knowing Him. And praying from the place that He is. You follow me? It'll make sense when we talk about healing here a little bit. But I want you to understand that I've seen us shift gears a lot. We pray and it doesn't happen. Bill lives. Bob dies. Bob lives. Bill dies. We'll give them both life and death. So we switch it around. But, but, but one we pray for and he lives. And we, yay. And the other one he dies. And then we go, wow, well, see, God doesn't heal everybody. Well, it mustn't be God's will to just heal everybody. But boy, he willed to heal Bill. He just, well, I guess it was Bob's time. And we just say stuff to explain every situation that we don't understand. And it's good to just stop trying to fill in the blanks and say, you know what? There's a place to grow up into Jesus in all things. I'm not totally sure why one lived and one died. But man, I know if Jesus touched him, he'd be whole. And if Jesus walked in the room and said, get up, he'd get up. He said, the things I do, you'll do if you believe. I'm not letting anything change my believer. I'm going after God. And I'm going to get this thing until my life looks like his. I haven't arrived. I'm not looking back. I'm going after this. You with me? All the controversy over healing that you hear out there and all the Christian books that combat each other and the way we've been divided, there's no topic bigger than healing probably that's divided the body of Christ because it involves loss, sentiments, and feelings. So people get really intense over the doctrine of healing because we've lost loved ones. So we're taking life really personal. And this thing has a bite to it, and it shows that we're not dead and seeking first the kingdom. Yeah? And sometimes you get so troubled about your loved one passing because you prayed and prayed and prayed, and then you get defensive, and you can hardly speak into the situation. And we've done ourselves injustice because a lot of people just presumptuously say, well, you just didn't have any faith. Well, please don't tell people that that are caring for their loved one and praying and doing everything they know. Don't just say, well, you didn't have no faith. If you had faith, they'd have been healed. You just be careful with that. And there's a, there's a way. See, Jesus said to his disciples, 
They said, why couldn't we heal the boy in Matthew 17? And he said, because of your unbelief. He didn't say, because you ain't got no faith. When he said, because of your unbelief, it translates into because of what you fail to see. Now, you be honest, when your loved one's hurting, you see that a lot of times way more than you've ever seen the revelation you're hoping manifests. What you see is a withering loved one. What you see is someone in trouble. What you see is somebody you can hardly recognize anymore. And then you get reduced to quoting a principle that you read in your Bible or you heard from a pulpit that if you say this, this should work. This is not a magic formula. It's a revelation we walk in that's backed by authority. It's not abracadabra. We're not Jesus name. We're not trying to find a rabbit in a hat. We're not saying a formula presto. In fact, using the Lord's name in vain, everybody thinks that's swearing. I use illustrations from the pulpit. Probably some of the only major criticism emails I get is people say, I can't believe you say, oh my God, when you preach. That is so like blasphemous and people are going to get turned off by that. And I just use it for examples and I don't, I don't say it in my everyday language, but, 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 but people get really bothered by that and say, that's using the Lord's name in vain. No, using the Lord's name in vain is without any effect and power. If he's name above every name, and every knee's going to bow and tongue confess, if you speak and mountains move, and we say in the name of Jesus, and nothing changes, that's probably using his name in vain. So rather than get troubled by that and rewrite theology and try to explain away our troubled hearts at the cost of truth, which makes us free, we should probably get humble. And say, teach me and grow me. Because if you touched them, they'd be changed. So get me to the place I see you. So that who you are becomes the expression of my life. But I'm not changing my mind. You said, whatever I ask in prayer, believing it shall be done. If I say to the mountain, move, it shall move. You didn't lie. The evidence of faith is the mountain moving, not me speaking to it. So grow me into a place, Lord, and let me walk in the place you abide. Because the Christ in me is the hope of glory. And I will not change my theology because of my experience to protect my soul. I will live out of my spirit and humble myself under the mighty hand of God. And you'll lift me up in a revelation. And I'll see more than I've ever seen before because I'm not changing my mind. You're the truth and I see the Father through you. Are you with me? Come on. I'm talking from a place where my own mother died and was sick for 40 years. So don't tell me I don't understand. I changed her diapers and carried her to bed. Don't even try to tell me I don't understand. Your mother's a pretty special person in your life to a young man. Most of the time. Most of the time you have struggles with dad, but mom stays special. Don't tell me I don't understand. Don't say, well, you don't know what it's like to lose somebody. (laughs) I've lost friends to cancer. But I've seen people healed of cancer. And I know we're on to something. And we're not going to change what we believe. Because they died. And we're going to get sentimental and take that personal. (laughs) We're going to take this personal. Until this overtakes everything. I don't care what denomination you are. I don't care what you grew up in. It's a no-brainer question. Wherever you grew up in church, whatever denomination, if you say, if Jesus walked in the room and touched the sick person that you love, what would happen? Nobody would have to think about their answer. They would say, well, they would be healed. I don't care what denomination. You could go to a a cessationist setting. And ask that question and they'd say, well, he'd be healed. But we're not Jesus. Well, no, we're not. No one ever said we are. But he's in us and Christ in us. The hope of glory, the body of Christ. As the Father sent me, so I send you. If you have faith, you'll say to the mountain, move. And the mountain move. And nothing will be impossible for you. Why do we miss all that scripture religiously saying, yeah, but we're not Jesus? 
Of course we're not Jesus, but he lives in us. And we're the body of Christ, which literally means the embodiment of the anointing. This thing is so simple and we fight over it because we're sentimental and we have issues because we've lost loved ones. So we're trying to defend our feelings instead of grow in the gospel. Anybody that's ever got heated with me over healing, I've had a few, not many. It's because they lost one, lost a mother. Confront me because he lost a mother. He doesn't know my mother's laying with tubes hanging out of her body while he's yelling at me. So he thinks I don't understand. Maybe I do. See, here's the thing about the gospel. I don't have to have used heroin and been addicted to minister to a heroin addict. It's the anointing that sets you free, not relativity. It's not relating. It's the gospel. I don't have to have been touched wrong to minister to somebody touched wrong. I don't have to have been through ritual abuse to have the answer for a person that has been through ritual abuse. But we think that you have to understand if you're going to reach me. What I understand is he loves you and the lie that was set against your life that's trying to destroy you is in fact a lie and you have a greater destiny than your yesterday. That's what I need to know. And I need to know that you're worth the blood of Jesus Christ and his spirit is just waiting to come upon you. And if you'll just dare believe that you're not what you were yesterday and you're what he paid for today, man, you can reach anybody. I've seen people so addicted on drugs. I remember a girl, the family didn't know what to do with her. She could not stop using heroin. And, and, and her husband was grieving. And she's running out there doing wild off the wall things. And they said, would you talk to her? And I said, I would gladly meet with her. And I met with her in my office. And, we, and I was pastoring full time. I don't have the same grace and, and time frame. And people know me now. Back then, nobody knew me. But Jesus knew me. And my sphere of influence knew that I knew Jesus. And I had fun in my life as a pastor. And they brought her into my office. And I didn't have a schedule like I have now. And I didn't have a thousand people emailing me to call them and pray with them. I didn't have people knocking on my door. Except a couple people from church now and then. Please don't knock on my door. People have been coming to my house, knocking on my door in the middle of the night because they find it in Scripture. And I'm a brother and I'm supposed to, if they keep knocking, answer. <laughs> Don't do that to each other. That's why you have church, ministry, family, body of Christ. If all of a sudden it's one or two people or five or 12 or 20 or 100 that have a revelation or a gift or an umbrella of anointing and you got to get under it to be healed... Those people are in trouble. They're going to get thronged and overwhelmed. And there's not, there's, there's, it's not the body of Christ. It's us do, doing what you guys are here for. I'm just happy about this. This is awesome. It is. It's, it's like, come on. Yeah, so don't come to my house. But, but I love you. But I asked her a couple questions and I ministered to her and it's discernment. You minister through discernment. There's no textbook to help people addicted. You got to touch the individual. It's, it's not a how do I minister to. There's no book on it. Stop writing those books that don't work. They're not, it's not a method. Some you snatch out of the fire. Some you save with compassion. You're to discern the difference in your relationship with Holy Spirit. And if you don't have an intimate relationship with Holy Spirit, why are you trying to help them? You can't. You can't minister to them. Because it's the power of God that changes things. It's not your counsel. It's the anointing of heaven. <laughs> yeah? You're like, you're not going to talk them into not using heroin. You teach them who they are. You, you trust that the Holy Spirit's going to capture their heart. And that they're sincerely through repentance going to cry out. And ask Jesus to set them free. Or look at you and for a glimmer just sincerely say, I don't want this anymore. Or something. And then you seize that and you go after that. And heaven comes and goes, bam, I've seen it a bunch. That, that girl, there was no hope for her. Her family was given up on her, but they loved her. And, and, and I watched her quiver 
When she prayed, I saw her quiver and she leaned back and her head hit a locker, real soft, not hard. And she just looked like she was going to slide down the locker. And I just kind of embraced her and I said, it's okay, that's Jesus, he loves you. And when she opened her eyes, she didn't even know why she ever used heroin. I've seen that quite a bit. Now, when I share a testimony of power and love, you know what happens? I'll get 500 emails in the next week. That say my relatives addicted that you need to talk to them. That's what will happen. That's why I don't even share testimonies anymore. Anybody that follows and listens. If you notice I don't share testimonies like that from the pulpit. For probably the last year and a half. Because it creates this bum rush of need. That says I need what's in your life. And the whole reason we're up here is saying it's in all of us. We're not ministers, we're believers, we're sons and daughters. I don't minister before I'm a son, I minister because I'm a son. Like, I know, I know, I never wanted to pastor. I told my church no three times. And they said, did you even pray about it? I said, I didn't even think about it. I don't need a pastor badge. Jesus is in my life. I told him I'm a warehouse worker in love with Jesus. And just because God's moving through me doesn't mean I'm in leadership. And they went. <sighs> and my pastor said, would you go ask the Lord if he wants you to pastor? I said, I can do that. And it was funny because I walked in my bedroom. That's where I like to go. And before I even closed the door, the spirit of the Lord came over me. And I never even talked to him. He just knew why I was coming, of course. And uh, it wasn't like he wasn't shuffling through papers. Do we have an appointment? <laughs> Are you supposed to be here? I'm meeting someone else. You know? No, he knows me and he knows why I'm coming. Just like he knows you. Same. The same. And he said, Dan, it's okay. I want you to do this. I put grace in your life to pastor. And I sat on my bed and cried because I knew it was the Lord. And. I'm zero administrative. I've never been to Bible school. I squeezed through city schools who lowered their curriculum to get the students through. And I am not an intelligent man. <laughs> my buddy calls me Father Wisdom. It's hilarious. <laughs> I got saved. My hair started turning white. It was funny. I was in my 30s. and started peppering right away when I got saved. I said, it's something's going on. <laughs> People said, are you stressed out? And I said, I don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> like, I don't even know what stress is. <laughs> My wife's laying in a coma, and I can't relate to stress. Because I'm not the husband of a wife in a coma before I'm a son in the Lord. And the only way I can address this is because of this. And if I'm becoming this and running this way, I'm in big trouble. And this is a formula that I'm hoping is working. I'm full of fear and there's no authority through fear. You have no authority over what you fear. Israel had Goliath defeated before he even opened his mouth. But because they didn't face him and listen to what he said, they were losing by default for 40 days. If any one of them would have just stood up and faced him in the covenant of God, he was outside of that box. He was done for the Lord was with them. They listened to his threats and looked at his size, looked with their eyes, thought with their mind. And every day they didn't confront him. They sat under the yoke of Goliath's shadow. <sighs> And you see it in the church. Then you got young little whippersnapper David coming along. Well, why are you guys? Why don't you go out and take him out? Like he's an uncircumcised Philistine. He doesn't have a covenant with God. He's already done. Little kid from the shepherd, just from the field, probably smells. He's just he's a little kid. And they're like, oh, David, you're proud. And who do you think? Oh, yeah, whippersnapper. <laughs> He's like, King, I'll take this dude out if nobody else is ready. You read the story, it's phenomenal. 
course David had a calling. Of course David had a, God had a plan in God. But don't tell me that if anybody else would have stood up in the boldness of David and the faith of David, that God wouldn't have backed it. The reason the little boy had to stand up is because nobody else would. Should already been a done deal. That's why he was surprised. Why, why, why is he still standing there? Why are you guys enduring this every day? Yak, 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 yak. Somebody needs to take that dude out. I'll do it. <laughs> Isn't that funny? It's amazing. You know, they send all the spies out into the land and they spy out the land that was promised to them. It's, it's your land. They go out there and say, whoo, there's giants in the land. It's an amazing land. The grapes are like bigger than us. <laughs> That's a little exaggeration, but they carried them between two men. They said, surely it's a land of milk and honey, just like God said. But we'll never take it. The people are too big and they outnumber us. We're like grasshoppers in their sight. And two youngsters, probably the youngest of the spies. If you look at it in chronologically, they were the youngest of the spies, I imagine. They said, what are you guys talking about? Of course we can take the land. God said it's ours. And over a million people believed the bad report and wanted to stone the two for saying we can take the land. No wonder when you preach on healing, they want to crucify you. No wonder when you preach on hope and the power of God. And yes, he can. People want to call you a heretic and say, chill out. Face reality, brother. Because that mentality has been on people since Adam ate that tree. And just because you name the name of the Lord doesn't mean you think like him, live like him, and have him in you. So be real careful. Because if your heart gets agitated by people like me, it's not because I'm wrong. It's because something's wrong. Because if I was wrong and you knew God, you would cry for me, not get mad at me. If I was that lost, you'd understand I'm a living soul. And if you really look at me, you can tell I'm sincere. I'm not a wolf in sheep's clothing. I never get called that. You can tell I at least believe what I'm saying. So if you thought I was that twisted man, you should be fasting and praying for me. That I'd come to the knowledge of truth, not writing bad things. You just prove you don't know him when you act like that. You prove you're presumptuous and you think you know about that person. But you reveal you don't know him. All I know is this. While I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me. <laughs> it doesn't say while you were yet a sinner, Christ blogged about you. And shared negative news. Said he gave his life. I guess if we really knew him, we'd give our life for one another, huh? Here's the other thing I learned when it comes to healing. The, may, the main pressure you get is from people that don't believe in healing, so they have no experience in healing, so they don't even pray for the sick. So their, their nothing is their validation. When they say God doesn't heal, it's because they've never experienced healing because they don't pursue it because they don't believe it. Dangerous position because then anybody that shares... Who truly has received a healing in their life since they've been saved in this room? Not even just at this conference, but just in your life, a healing. Now you look at all the hands that are raised. Now watch. When you take the position that God doesn't heal, then when you raise your hand, you're either deceived, an emotionalist, a liar, or of the devil. There's no other answer then. You force yourself into that box, and that's what the Pharisees always said about Jesus. It's dangerous company. Like when you take that strong stand that he doesn't heal, then you make everybody with a healing testimony a liar. Do you see how presumptuous it is? 
Wow. Did you see all the hands that raised? Now watch this. Let me ask you another question. So how many of us have prayed for something, but it never changed or we didn't see it change in the person's life? Wow. As many, if not more hands, huh? That right there is what creates the problem. So we assess intellectually, get away from the word, spiritually analyze, and come up with answers to try to settle our quandary. Almost assume an arrogant position that, hey, if I prayed it, it should have happened because I believed, and if it's faith and God said it, it should have happened. So obviously he didn't will to heal. Did you ever hear that? Did you ever hear somebody say, well, it's just a season of grace in their life. God chose not to heal him. Todd talked about the thorn a little yesterday. They say, remember Paul, he decided not to heal him, just sustained him by grace. God's just going to work his glory through their sickness. Did you ever hear all that? When did you ever hear Jesus say anything like that? When did Jesus ever say, go get more faith and you can be healed? When did you ever see Jesus turn somebody away and say, I'd love to heal you, but it's just not your time. God wants you to go through a season because he's trying to form you in a couple areas of your life. When did anybody hear Jesus say any of those things? Have you ever heard Christians say them and write books saying that? Where do they get the inspiration? Human intellect. Because Jesus never said any of those things. Did Jesus ever say any of those things? And when you see him, you see the father. So is the father saying any of those things? Jesus said, I only say what I hear him. Why didn't Jesus ever say any of those things? Because father never did. So why do we? Because we're trying to make intellectual sense through natural facts. And we're missing spiritual truth. And I'm not being mean. It's a form of pride. Because you're assuming your knowledge is greater than the word. It's a puffed up place. Because when my mother dies. And I start writing why God doesn't heal based on that experience. Now I'm living outside of Jesus' life. And I'm writing theology outside of truth. Yeah, I'm, I'm already on a roll. But thanks for the encouragement. Are you guys getting some out of this? Can you see that I'm not picking a fight with anybody? My own mother died of sickness. She was sick for 40 years. I started to believe wrong things because I was young in the Lord when I got saved. Very zealous. So I saw a couple of miracles right out of the gate. I'm, oh, I'm running right over to mom. Mom, you're getting healed. I'm fired up. I told her I'm going to make a covenant with her, agreement with her. I'm going to come to her house every day before work until I see her healed. I'm going to pray for her. She said, okay. My mom was the sweetest thing ever. She didn't walk for 15 years. She was in bed for 15 years and didn't walk. She was sick for 40 and drug her body through the house. She'd mess herself, couldn't get to the bathroom. We'd have to, I'd have to change my own mother. Don't tell me I don't get it. 40 years is a long time. On the fourth day, I went in her house. And when I opened the door, she felt the presence of the Lord come over her. And her left side, which hadn't moved for years, was tingling and her hand was going like this. So I walked in and I'm zealous anyway. I'm in love with Jesus. I'm like a freight train. And I come in the house, and I said, hey, mom. And she said, she's leaning back. I said, are you okay? She said, yeah. I said, what's going on? She said, the presence of the Lord came on me as soon as you turned the doorknob. Look at my hand. And I'm like, whoa. <laughs> and I'm like fired up, praying, walking through the house, joy in Jesus, praying in tongues. She sat, she watched. She watched TV all the time because she was housebound. It's kind of like somebody takes pain meds. All of a sudden, they're addicted to them and don't even realize it. 
She's a Christian lady. She has a little daily devotional stuff. She prays, talks to the Lord. But she got in this pattern because she couldn't walk. She's housebound. She's in house. She had a visiting nurse. She got in this habit. TV got her through the day. Now don't panic. I'm not preaching legalism here. I want you to understand something. I'm, I'm preaching what I started to believe because of what I saw. And then I let my belief rest on something. And I, I got way deceived. She's watching. You, you guys know the older folks here. I'll know there's an old show called Perry Mason. She used to like that kind of stuff. It's all fiction. But she'd like the way it worked out. And the smarts of Perry Mason. And how it all. Wow. I get it. And all the pieces come together. She was entertained. She's watching Perry Mason. And the presence of the Lord comes on her. She's moving her left hand for the first time in years. So I'm all fired up. You can imagine. I'm, I'm months old in the Lord. And I'm just raging. I'm like, yeah. And I'm like, Mom, when's the last time you prayed in tongues? Because she said, that's so beautiful. You're praying in tongues. I said, well, you were baptized in the Spirit of God when I was a kid. I remember you praying in tongues when you were in your <laughs> mid-upper 20s. And I was just little and I didn't even understand. She said, yeah. And I said, well, don't you pray in tongues? She said, I haven't for years. I said, what? Why? I don't know. I said, mom. And she's like, oh. it was just fun. So mom's just getting rekindled, crying. I would talk to her and she'd just cry. She said, your heart's so pure when you talk, it makes me cry. And I'm like, Jesus changed me, mom. And it was just fun. So on that day, she's moving her hand, and the TV's on loud, and I said, Mom, I'm going to turn that off. She said, okay. I clicked it off, because she was staring at it. I muted it, and she was looking at it. I turned it off. Now, think about this. Her left hand's moving. You put yourself in somebody else's shoes, and you think what they should be. I'm thinking she should be freaking out. And she seemed kind of a little stoic, not much, but she was excited, but she wasn't like, wow. She was just, look at this. I'm like, Mom, you haven't done that for how long? She said, years. I said, that's the Lord. She said, yeah, it has to be. I said, you're being healed. I said, it's going to be your elbow, your shoulder, your leg. Woo! So I'm like, ah, <laughs> So I prayed over. I had to get to work. I prayed over. She's sitting there. She's peaceful. And as I'm going out the door, she said, hey. I said, yeah, I'll see you tomorrow, Mom. She said, can you flip the TV back on quick? She said, just leave it play. I want to see who did that. And I didn't realize how I came across. I must have been like, what? You don't realize how you touch people when you're zealous and they're not as zealous as you. I actually condemned her and I didn't know it. I made her feel bad and I didn't know it because I was so zealous. I said, what? You want me to turn on the TV? Mom, you're sitting in the presence of God and your left hand's moving. Are you kidding? I'm not turning on the TV. You don't need the TV on. Dan, the Lord's not going to get mad if I watch the end of Perry Mason. <laughs> I said, well, I don't think he's going to get mad, but why would you even want to, Mom? And I'm starting on this thing, and I'm trying to make her feel like I would if I was her. Did you ever do that? Did you ever get overzealous and push a family member away and think you were just preaching and their heart might have been hard? No, maybe you went beyond grace and tried to push your zeal on them. Maybe you passed by grace. <laughs> Do you know how you get excited about something and you want everybody you care about the most to be just excited so you run and share your excitement and when they don't go, what? You're wondering why they're not all excited. And next thing you know, in a minute, you're not even excited anymore because they didn't react. <laughs> you see why you're laughing so hard? Because everybody knows exactly what I'm talking about. And none of that stuff ever happens in the kingdom. Angels sit and go, what in the world are they doing? What is this new thing? Because <laughs> it's not the kingdom. It's self stuff. It's crazy. So I left. And she said, and I turned the TV on, but I must have been like, oh, okay, whatever. I don't understand, but see you tomorrow. I come in the next day. And I walk through the door, and I'm all excited. And she's just sitting there. I said, hey, mom. She said, hi. 
I said, how you doing? I'm okay. I said, is your hand still moving? She said, yeah. I said, you ready to pray? She said, well, I need to talk to you about that. I just don't think I'm ready to be healed. I was like, what do you mean? You were never ready to be sick. Do you know we pray for people that have been through terrible sickness and we go to pray for them and they say, I'm just ready to go. Don't ever sell out to that. You don't have to tell them you're still praying for them, but don't just say, well, they don't want to be healed. They're ready to go. The only reason they're ready to go is because they lost sight of what it's like to be whole because they've suffered so much. If they were healed in a second, they wouldn't even think they're ready to go. They wouldn't even think about that. The only reason they're ready to go is because they're overwhelmed by the sickness. That's not some heart thing where God is blocking all your prayers because of their will. I hear people teach that. They're they're deceived. They're overwhelmed by sickness. So if Jesus walked in and just took their hand and lifted them up out of the bed, do you think they'd go, no, what did you do? Oh, no, I was ready to go. The people that tell you they're ready to go, it's because they've been through so much pain in their sickness and hell They're just ready to go. It's understandable. But we think that's their will. And it can't be overridden. I've been in hospital rooms. One specific room where the whole family said, Dan, you need to know when to just resolve this thing. None of us are in faith for that. And we're just ready to let him go. And I said, guys, I'm your pastor and I love you. And you know I love you. I'm not trying to agitate you or offend you. But you show me where that's even our prerogative. For you to say I'm just ready to go when it's not your life, why is it even your prerogative? Because maybe Jesus isn't ready for you to go. Maybe he has a nation waiting for you. Like when is it your decision? When you seek first the kingdom. This stuff puzzles me. I've seen it a lot. And I see us really highly regard each other's opinions and wills. I'd rather try to challenge your will if I don't see it kingdom. In that situation, this is years and years ago. I was just starting pastoring. A couple times I got accused of being insensitive and green. And need to grow and mature a little. I'll take those prayers all you want. Pray for me about that. I will take that grace. But I remember that man's liver got completely healed and he never died. And the whole family was, when I walked in, they were all crying because the doctor just left the room and said, there's no hope. And they just said, look, this thing's just at a place we're just ready to let him go. He's lived a pretty long life and a good life. And I said, I don't understand that. I'm going to pray. For him to live. And I'm sorry. Don't get mad at me. Well we're ready to let him go. And I walked over and I said buddy. I'm just going to believe with you. Please can I? They were like we'd rather you just go and not pray. I said please just let me pray. If he's going to go anyway. I guess it won't matter if I pray huh? Well if you need to pray. See they were fighting this in their emotions. Do you know why people say, well, man, that'd be awesome if it happened. But if I were you, I'd just be careful about getting your hopes up. That is self-preserving. I don't want you to get your hopes up because I would hate to see you heartbroken. You let down. So when people say that, what are they trying to do? Protect you as an individual. But the Bible says faith is the substance of things. So when a Christian sentimentally tells another Christian, if I were you, I wouldn't get my hope up, is it scriptural? You say, well, hope deferred makes the heart sick, brother. That's the point. When do you ever let your hope get deferred? (laughs) Why do we always read scripture on the surface and say, well, that just be, man, yeah, 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 oh, yeah, 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 oh. When you live hopeless, who's ever lived hopeless, honestly, for a season in something? You were hopeless. Was it the most miserable, awful place to be? It's because you're never created to be hopeless. The devil's the only one hopeless. He's the only one hopeless. There's no chance for repentance. His day is sealed. 
Time's coming. Jesus comes as a man, empowered by God, walking on the earth, and the spirits realize it's Jesus. Evil spirits go, ah, it's you. Because they know Jesus. But he's in a man's body. They get near him, perceive the anointing, and all of a sudden, Christ is coming out. And they go, it's you. And they bow immediately and cower and say, are you here to torment us before our time? Why? There's no thing they can do to stop that day. They look over their shoulder every day, wondering if today's the day he's coming. <sighs> they live in fear. And they love when people made in the similitude of God live in fear. They love when people made in the image of God live hopeless. They can't go defeat God, but they are sure they can defeat you and God in you and get you to become just like them. And that's their goal. And that's their mission. To reproduce after their own kind. He loves when you fight. He loves when you bicker. He loves when you bad mouth somebody. Because he's winning. He's not impressed with our worship. He's impressed with your love. Your humility. Your obedience to the word. He's not impressed with our Christian t-shirts. He's not impressed with our flags. Our giftings. He's impressed with our sincere surrender. And the integrity of Christ that flows through our lives. Because there's nothing he can do to touch that. The ruler of this world cometh. And has nothing in me. Jesus said that. The one that said follow me. The one that said the things I do. You'll do. The Bible says he that keeps himself. The evil one touches him not. <laughs> you ought to feel what I feel right now. <laughs> Do you feel a little of that right there? Do you feel that? <laughs> Shoo. <laughs> See, that's not my fault. It's not because I'm somebody. Believe. <laughs> He loves when I talk like this. <laughs> he really does. It agitates some people, but man, he inspires me sometimes to go here. And just, you just People say, do you see him strutting on the stage? You have no idea. When you feel what I'm feeling right now, I probably look like I'm strutting because I've been like, I mean, <laughs> and all of a sudden you understand no fear. All of a sudden you understand you love not your own life. And all of a sudden you understand you, he's the Lord. He's the Lord. And all of a sudden, you're not reduced to surviving and making it and getting by and breakthrough and provision. He's the Lord. And he lives in me. And it's a big deal. <laughs> yeah? And I won't be reduced to hopeless and fear-driven and frustrated and angry and opinionated and jealous and proud. Why? Because none of those things were me or you from the beginning. They were what we became through Adam. And you must be born again. Why we preach a born again and allows all those things to stay as normal is beyond me. It's a, it's a deception. Born again is born again. Die, live. New way. The way. You guys good? I didn't cover this healing thing so great yet. I don't know what I'm doing right now. I feel like a rooster. <laughs> yeah. Man, oh man. Let me take you, let me do one thing. We, we used to preach this a lot together, Todd and I in Power and Love. I haven't preached this for a long time. I don't, I don't even talk about healing that much. I, I get up in the platforms and you don't understand that I don't have a plan. I'm not thinking, okay, I got five sessions at this church this weekend. I'll cover this, 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 this. It's never that way. I don't even think about what I'm going to say. 
I touch and love people, talk, get to know the pastor and leaders, having a good time. And next thing you know, I'm up there and I flip the mic on. And I'm on a journey with you. I'm, I'm honest. The way we preach, you know we can't have this prepared. Like half the time, I don't know where I'm at. And towards the end, I'm like, oh, that's so awesome. I see now. Yeah. Like I'm on a journey. I'm just having fun, man. I want you to go to Matthew 17 with me quickly. We'll, we'll cover this. I did share some important things with healing just with foundation belief. Here's what, here's what I believe Holy Spirit wants to accomplish this morning. That a room of this size, we could just settle on one thing and not fight over it. And then purpose to grow into the expression of the one thing we believe. That God is a healer. That he wants to heal. That he paid the price to heal. And the earth he gave to the children of men. And we're going to grow up into him. Live without fear. Walk in authority. And we're going to see what Jesus promised. Because we're not changing our mind. Healing is the will of God. And it's for today. We've got to believe that. Or you'll never have faith to pray for the sick. Faith begins where the will of God is realized. The reason so many people don't have faith, they're still questioning the will of God. We throw it around like a hot potato. Who can know the will of God? Well, you're supposed to. The Bible says, don't be unwise in Ephesians 5, 17. Understand the will of the Lord. Romans 12, 2 says, don't be conformed to the world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind so you can prove the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. We're supposed to know the will of God. How can we possibly know the mysterious will of God? It's not mysterious. The mystery's revealed. It's Christ. Jesus is the will of the Father revealed. When you see me, you've seen him. How can you say, show us the Father? He's already been shown. Yeah. <sighs> but you know what analytical tendency is and the way that seemeth right to man and human intellect that just keeps jumping in the way? Keep assessing God along the way, defining God along the way, writing books to reveal God through your own personal experiences. But it's at the cost of truth and truth's what's make you free and that's why there's not a lot of freedom in folks. Because they don't know what to believe. How are you going to pray for the sick if you're not sure it's the will of God to heal. How are you going to pray for the sick with confidence? Did I take you to Matthew 17? Okay. Okay, good. Because right now, I'm going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Go there with me. It's not my fault. I just got instruction. You should have heard it. It came from the control center, I promise. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter 1. Matthew 17 was a real good idea. We might get there, but one of the O's came out of good on that last suggestion. <laughs> and it was God. Second Corinthians chapter 1, verse 15. Paul's writing to the Corinthians, and in this confidence I intended to come to you before. I just want you to be up to speed. That's why I'm starting in 15, that you might have a second benefit. He's talking to the Corinthians because he's going back and forth. He's on his way to Macedonia, and then he's coming back through. And what he's saying is, man, I came by you guys on purpose. This was something I saw in the Lord so you could have a second benefit. You guys loaded me up with everything I needed for the sake of Christ, for the cause of the kingdom. Man, you dealt with me as a brother, as family, as a minister of the Lord. We're all one. You gave me everything necessary to do what God was wanting me to do, and you loaded me up. And on my way back, I wanted to give you a second benefit and let you co-labor and partner with where I'm heading. And I passed back by so you could do that for me again. That's what he's saying. He's not taking an offering. He's saying, empower me to get to where I need to go and do what God's calling me to do. Are you following? He said, I intended to come to you before that you might have a second benefit. Pass by way of you to Macedonia. And then come again from Macedonia back by you and be helped by you on my way to Judea. What's he saying? Guys, I've laid down my life. I'm going after the kingdom. I'm going from city to city preaching the gospel. I'm getting stoned. I'm getting beat. I'm getting whipped. But I don't love my own life or count it dear. I'm going to fulfill the will of God. Will you help me get to Judea? That's why he came back. Now watch. Watch. Therefore, when I was planning to do this, 
Man, he shifts totally spiritual now. Watch. When I was planning to do this, did I do it lightly? Or the things that I plan, do I plan according to the flesh? Just human need. Hey, maybe I ought to, you know, I wonder if those guys in Corinthians will help me again. Maybe I should just swing by and see if they'll, maybe they'll give me some food and a little cash. He's, watch. The things that I plan, do I plan according to the flesh? Watch. He goes spiritual. That with me there should be a yes, yes, and no, no. What's he saying? He's saying the flesh is indecisive. When you live in the flesh, one day you're saying yes, the next day you're saying no. You're saying, hey, maybe I'll come and see you and you never show up. When you live in the flesh with you, there's a yes and a no. But he says the gospel that I brought to you as God is faithful, our word to you was not yes and no. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, by me, Silvatus Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him was yes. Are there promises for healing in the Bible? Is there? Are you sure? Okay, so there is. You're confident? Okay. So for all, how many? All the promises, are there promises for healing? Okay. For all the promises of God in Him are? All the promises are what? Then where do we get a no? Because we've discerned the doctrine of healing through the flesh, through the people that didn't get healed when we prayed. And now we have a maybe he will, maybe he won't, but let's pray and see. There's zero faith in that. So if you marry yes and you marry no, guess who their children are? Maybe so, maybe not. Let your yes be yes and your anything else is of the evil one. Why do we have a yes and no doctrine concerning healing? Because it came from the evil one. And we've intellectually received it and assessed it through the facts. And the way that seems right to a man keeps leading to destruction. The gospel isn't yes and no. The gospel is yes and amen. In him it was yes. For how many promises? Do you have promises for healing? All the promises of God in him are, now watch this, and in him, don't think the devil doesn't know these scriptures, watch, and in him, so be it, watch, to the glory of God through, so where's the healing flowing through? You see why we've been targeted with unbelief? If every promise is to the believer and you were the enemy, what would you try to confuse and mix up? What men believe, and you'd get them to fight over it instead of love one another. And you get them to take their losses personal and take the fact that their mother died and let them internalize it and fester when somebody preaches God's will to heal when you prayed and prayed and prayed and watched them die. I know I backed off the story with my mother. Don't think I need to go back there. Actually, I don't need to share that. God's got me right here. This is right where we need to be. I just believed the wrong thing about my mother for a long time. And I believed she couldn't be healed because she didn't want to be healed. And that wasn't true. I should just went in there every day and just kept praying. These signs shall follow those who... It doesn't say these signs shall follow those that believe that are sick. Who's representing the kingdom most of the time to a sick person? The Christian. So guess what he's called to be? A believer. And the signs follow those who 
He'll lay his hands on the sick. Why does he have to lay his hands on the sick? Because Christ is in you. And you and I are supposed to understand when you lay your hands on the sick, he's going to flow through you and touch them. You say, well, God could just do it if he wants to. He's God. I get that. But why is that even a comment in us? You can't heal anybody, but he tells you to heal the sick. He expects you to understand that we're one and he put himself in you because he wants to live in you and flow through you because he gave the earth to the children of men and he wants to reveal himself through people. <laughs> this thing's not hard. Is every promise yes and amen? Is there promises for healing? So they're yes, but we haven't seen them always answered. And then we get quandaries and complex. Be honest with me. Did you ever pray because you were frustrated? Did you ever pray because you were scared? Did you ever pray because you were overwhelmed? Did you ever pray because you were desperate? Most of the time, that's where everybody seems to be praying from. So we have these fear lines called prayer lines. And we think with technology, if we can get the more people praying, the better. And it's all driven by fear because the problem's so big, you're hoping we can get enough people to crack the egg. When one has faith, says to the mountain, it moves. It's fear line. I'm not against prayer lines. I'm against fear. She what? No way. Yeah, immediately. Look, you got to pray. So-and-so just, we got to pray. Get it all over. Put it on Facebook. Yeah, okay. I can't tell you how many times that calls come to me. And I stopped getting them to even tell me what happened. And I say, listen, first thing I need you to do is calm down, okay? Take a deep breath. No, I, I can tell it's a serious situation. I, I understand. Just calm down. We're going to pray. You got to get that thing out of there. How many times have we been that way, prayed, 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 and nothing changed? More than we can remember? How many times were we in possible situations and it changed? Let's weigh the two, because the not change far has outweighed the change. And let's look at our disposition, where we're coming from and praying, and let's learn from it, not create theology through it. If you become a product of what you're going through and you start praying, we don't pray because we're afraid we're going to die. We pray because we're promised life, and we have a will of God to fulfill on the earth, and we have destiny to write. You're not praying to survive. You're praying to do all that he's called you to. You're asking for another day because you're willing to live it in him. You're not asking another day because you want to see your grandkids. I'm a grandpa. Don't get mad at me. I understand what I'm saying. Don't get mad at me or that gives you away. (laughs) Be honest. We pray more because we want to see our grandkids. And because we want to live the will of God. And this gospel has become sentimentally driven. And we're trying to survive. And don't realize it. And somebody's got to call that thing. Blow a whistle and say hey. What are we doing? Let's stop being so sentimentally driven. Of course I want to see my granddaughter. I'm not praying for another day to see my granddaughter. I'm praying because the will of God. Needs to be fulfilled on the earth. And in that will of God being fulfilled, of course, I get to enjoy my granddaughter. But unless you love less all these things, you'll by no means be my disciple. So you can't let the sentiment of family rise above the call of the kingdom. Are you okay? All the promises of God are yes and amen in Him and to the glory of God through... Us. And Ephesians 3. To God be all the glory, right? Who can do exceedingly, abundantly, above all we can ask, think, or imagine through the power that worketh in us. He never separates us. And then we say, well, that was God. And he wants to be God through us. Are you with me? Now we can go to Matthew 17. Oh, verse 21, though. You don't have to go back there. Just let me read it. This is good. Now, he who establishes us with you in Christ, 
the one that's done this and has anointed us. So guess what you are? Ah, brother, I just need the anointing. No, you got to start believing you're anointed. Brother, you need to pray for me for the anointing. No, I'm not. You need to start believing you're anointed. Do you know how many times I walked in my bedroom when you weren't looking? Father, I just thank you. You live in me and you've anointed me. I thank you that when I touch, you touch. Father, when these hands lay upon sickness, sickness flees because you're the Lord and you live in me. Father, I thank you that your Lordship rules my life and you've anointed me. My cup is full and running over. You've strengthened me like the wild ox. I can't be yoked. No one's going to bind me to do their will. I'm here to do yours, Lord. Thank you for the anointing of God upon my life. I've walked my bedroom floor and done that countless times when you weren't looking and then you see me in the passion and hear a testimony and miss where it comes from and you just call it gifting if you're not careful and say give it to me brother I can't give you my relationship but I can sure encourage you to develop one and tell you you have as much access to him as I ever will and he knows your name yeah isn't that good Matthew 17 and then I gotta quit I got a time frame Tom will be on me he won't let me come back to any power and loves (laughs) Stop that. I'm trying to calm down. Matthew 17, verse 14. (laughs) You're going to have to stop that. (laughs) We don't have much time. Matthew 17 is an interesting chapter. Jesus takes Peter, James, and John and takes them off on a mountain, right? Mountain of transfiguration. Jesus literally turns inside out and the glory that's in him shines round about. They look and go, whoa, kingdom of God. They want to build a a little thing there, right? And, 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 And God says, this is my beloved son. Hear him. It's powerful. They come down. You got to be careful. When you read this stuff, you got to realize and think through it. Don't go fast. It's not a Bible story. Don't just try to read it to quote it. Catch everything there. Like you got to make sure that the nine that aren't with the three, you got to make sure that if you're in that nine, you're not standing there going, why does he always take Peter, James, and John? (laughs) No, this is real. I mean, I laid my life down too. How come they always get to go to places with him and I don't get to go? Why is he, he's so, he says, he's so biased. He's clicky. He's got favorites. I, oh, this is real. You got to look at that stuff and say, man, I don't ever want that to be me. I don't want to be an offended disciple. I don't want to say, well, Jesus spends more time with so-and-so and he's more personal. All of a sudden you got issues with Jesus. The one you say you're following. And worse yet, issues with your brothers, because they got a special in. Oh, this stuff's real. You better make sure that's never you. You better make sure that you didn't learn that from Adam and didn't get that driven out of you through the new truth that came through Jesus. You got to get that out of you. You can't bring Jesus into that. It doesn't fit. That's a forced Lego. It won't work. These guys, seven chapters before, went out two by two and healed the sick and did miracles. Are you aware of that? Jesus sent them out two by two in Matthew 10. So in Matthew 17, you know word spreads. People talk, right? They can't find Jesus. They got this boy who's going into violent seizures. It's epilepsy and it's intense and it's it's violent. It's demonic. 
And they can't find Jesus, but they see the nine that are running with Jesus. They don't see 12. They see nine. They don't know where Jesus is. I imagine they approached him, recognized they're his disciples. They knew that they went out and already did miracles in his name. I'm sure they wouldn't have probably approached him. Or they might have said, it's all speculation at this point. They might have came up and said, where's the teacher? We're not really sure Peter, James, and John and him took off that way. Why? Well, our, our, my son is, oh man, we'll pray for him. He gave us authority. No matter how it happened, at some point the man had the disciples pray for the boy. And we ought to pay attention to it and talk about it a lot. Because it's the only time in the New Testament when men prayed and it didn't happen concerning healing. And since it's happened to us a lot. And Jesus had a lot to say about it. We probably ought to talk about it. When they had come to the multitude, that's Jesus, Peter, James, and John, come back to the multitude. A man came to him kneeling down and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son. He's an epileptic. He suffers severely for he often falls into the fire, often into the water. Watch. Tough right here, man. It's happened to us. It's happened to every one of us that's ever got involved in praying for the sick. So I brought him. So I brought him to your disciples. Why not? Who else am I going to? You, you sent these boys out. They're doing their stuff. They're anointed. So I brought him to your disciples. But they could not cure him. Bummer, huh? Seriously, I, fighting back tears. That's a bummer. Do you ever hold a child dying of cancer? I've been in the middle of this thing for a long time. I've seen a few that had to die according to medical diagnosis and they lived. But man, I've, I've, seen, I've seen one too many that had to die according to medical diagnosis die. And I want them to live. But you can't get afraid. You can't get in a quandary. You got to take the next one in your arms. You got to hold him and know he loves him. And he paid a price and he lives in you. And you can't produce a thing. You can't plead and beg. But man, you can believe. Yeah? I'll be honest. There was times that what I saw was over the head of where I had grown. Are you with me? I've been called into the back curtains of emergency rooms. And what you see, I walked into a place where a guy I knew was in a coma for months. And when I, I was like, I'll go pray for him. I was seeing so many things in my life. And I walked in the room presumptuously. Ah, rah, rah, I'll go pray for him. I walked in the room and it didn't even look like the man I knew. And my heart shrank and I cried and realized I wasn't prepared for what I saw. And I cried and I wept and I turned and I left the room and went back to my bedroom and repented for presumption and said, God, forgive me for not being prepared. What I saw wrecked me. I would have been religious to try to pray. I was so shaken. And I knelt and I prayed and I read a couple of Psalms and I got my heart prepared based on what I knew I was walking into, called his wife. We went, we put our hands over him like this. I've never done it since. Don't write a book on it. Ah, oh, man, this book craze. Everything we turn, everything Holy Spirit does by inspiration into a Christian method and lose the power and spontaneity of the Spirit. I was praying for a demon-possessed lady one time, and the Lord said, sing this song. I didn't know it was a song that moved her heart, and it was her favorite Christian song. But I've never done it since. You don't write a book. To sing over the demonic. And songs of deliverance. And you listen to Holy Spirit. And do what he says. Yeah. I'm ministering to a boy. Um, or a man. And I see a boy. 12 years old on the street of New York. Crying mommy. Mommy. And the man's 35. 38. His wife's eight years older. Her complaint in their counseling session was, I always feel like his mother. He always treats me like a mother, not a wife. 
I want to be his love of his life, not his mother. And I couldn't break through, and I'm, I'm talking, and I get this picture of a boy 12. Well, he ain't 12. And I said, why do I see a 12-year-old crying on the streets of New York? And he went, crying mom on the streets. And he went, and I've never seen a man since then cry so hard in my life. He couldn't even breathe. He went hysterical. And he curled up in a fetal position in his chair and fell, screaming, shaking. His condition so broke the heart of his wife, who wouldn't even look at him in the room. They were acting like they weren't even saved. She ran and cuddled him and started crying because mercy flooded her heart. When he got up and told us the story, his mom was a heroin addict and she Hansel and gretel him on the street because she couldn't take care of him. So when he was 12, she took him into the crowds of New York and disappeared in an alley and left him. And he never saw his mother again. He ran to his aunt and uncles crying and said, he's so innocent. He said, I lost mom. I don't know what happened to mom. They knew she's a heroin addict. And they're like, oh my gosh, we'll just take you in. It's okay. A couple days later, they find her dead in an alley somewhere. They decided to keep the honor of mother and not share what happened and just say she passed from whatever at a young age. His wife didn't even know the story. So he is using his wife to take the place of this whole mother deficit. So watch. Holy Spirit gave me the vision. You tell the story, people go, wow, that's amazing. And then we create ministries and think everybody needs their past healed. If Holy Spirit doesn't give you the vision and take you there, why are you going there? And why do you ask him to take you there when you're to live forward? So it's gotten so extreme that now there's ministries that say they're hearing in the Lord your mother said this when you were inside her. It's demonic. God is not putting a hurdle on the track of your identity for you to jump. He's not giving you knowledge you know nothing about. Love covers a multitude of sin. I had a guy tell me he was falling apart in his life and he come to me, he's justifying all this ministry he's receiving. And he never changed and he fell away from God and never served the Lord. And I said, what's going on with you? What are you learning in those sessions? He said, well, I learned that when I was one and a half, my dad whipped me with a belt for picking a green tomato out of his garden. I said, dude, are you for real? Do you believe that? Do you remember that? I don't have any idea, but they said that happened. They saw it in the spirit and that's why I act the way I act. So now you have a permission slip to act that way. How are you free? It's misguided. You don't ask him to go where he told you to not go. It's out of bounds. I don't care if you ask Holy Spirit. He's not taking you there. He'll take you there in gifting if need be. He showed me that. When he doesn't show me that, I give him truth. When he shows me that, I follow him. And here's the difference between the two. That was a one time, bam, a sword wrecked him and healed their marriage. In four minutes. This ministry stuff is annual, monthly, years. Out of bounds. It's out of bounds. And you know what you're teaching people? Without realizing it, you're only doing as good as you feel, think, and remember. So you're teaching them to live sensual, not by faith. So people are getting ministry because something's wrong. I must have a closet I need cleaned. I'm not feeling right. Something's blocking. Something's unsettled. There must be more stuff. And then you go for more ministry. And the whole time your identity is not solid. And then you think you're feeling better because you settled a thing. But when are you ever free? Because as soon as you feel out of sorts, there must be another problem. <sighs> so when are you ever free? Well, we're probably never really free, brother. We're always just. Well, then why do we sing we're free? 
Why does the Bible say we're free? <laughs> okay, I'll get off of that. I'm so late. <sighs> Verse 16. Verse 16. So I brought him to your disciples. They couldn't cure him. And Jesus answered and said, Oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring the boy to me. Is he talking to the dad? Who's he talking to? I brought him to your disciples. So he's talking to a fallen man, really. But his disciples are part of his conversation because they're thinking like men. He says, watch. Watch what he says. It sounds harsh. It's not. Watch. He's been telling them, I'm going to go. I'm going to be turned over. I'm going to be beaten. I'm going to be crucified. On the third day, I'm going to rise. You know he's been doing that? He's been telling them what's coming. He's been preparing them. I'm, I'm going to die. I'm not going to be here soon. I'm going to be turned over to the hands of sinful men. They're going to, the Son of Man will be crucified. And they're like, oh, what? It's amazing when you read Scripture. He says, and on the third day, I will rise. And the next verse says, and they were all filled with grief. When you read the story, you think they'd have said, dude, wait, what? What What'd you just say? You're going to rise? Look, I heard you say you're going to die, but what's this rise thing? They were so subservient to death that all they could hear was death. They couldn't hear he was going to rise because they're under the bondage of the fear of death. So when he said he's going to die, they're going, you can't die. You're the best thing that ever happened to us today. I'm about dying. You can't die. They couldn't even hear he was going to raise because all they heard is he's going to die. On the third day, I will rise. And they were filled with grief. Or sorrow. Ain't that something? Watch. Oh, perverse generation. It means twisted minded, corrupted thinking people. Perversion, twisted. Your minds twist. You twisted minded people. How long shall I be with you? Look, guys, our days are numbered. I'm not going to be here much longer. I'm about ready to go to the Father. I'm going to hand you the baton of the New Covenant, New Testament church. How long shall I bear with you? Look, you're going to represent me and be the body of Christ. You guys have to get this. Bring the boy to me. <laughs> Is that in your Bible? Did Jesus ever do anything that wasn't the will of God? So if Jesus healed the boy, was it the will of God to heal the boy? Would he correct them if they couldn't have? Would he? Did he correct them? Could they have healed the boy? Was it the will of God to heal the boy? Was he healed when the nine disciples prayed? Oops. Then why do we say, well, it must have been the will of God. Well, you know, sometimes God just uses grace to teach you things in your life. There's probably something he's trying to establish in your life. And he's using sickness as the tool, brother. Well, on God's good time, when he's good and ready, he'll do it, man. You don't have to ask. God will just do what God does. Anybody ever hear anybody talking like this? Was it the will of God to heal that boy? Was he healed when the disciples prayed? And the disciples had already seen miracles seven chapters before. Here's what Jesus is telling them. He rebuked the demon. It came out in that very hour. And the disciples, I love this part. It's my favorite part. I know I don't have favorites, but this is my favorite part. Until we get to verse 20. And then that's my favorite. <laughs> then the disciples, it is. Because verse 20 is the best new covenant promise you have in the whole new covenant. The disciples came to Jesus privately, privately, and they said, watch. What a question, straight up. Why could we not cast that thing out? Jesus did not say, because you ain't got no faith. He said, because of your unbelief, it translates because of what you fail to see. You're not seeing what I'm seeing. Your mind shift and get perverted because of the fall. Give them some slack, the disciples. Severe epilepsy. Is there a seizure? Is there visual? They're praying. He's seizing. He's not slowing down or stopping. Their minds kick in. Perverse generation. Wonder why he's not healed yet. Wonder why he's still seizing. 
Man, if Jesus was here, he'd be healed by now. Wonder what we're doing. And every time they pray, after the first time they pray, and they fail to see who they are now that he's here. And they're driven by the need and in a quandary because there's no change. Has that ever happened to you praying for the sick? Why couldn't we heal the boy? Why couldn't we cast it out? He said to them, because of your... Oh, I love this part. But truly, assuredly, depends what translation you have. I, who, who says? We really should honor Jesus like we say we honor him. And take him at his word. I say to you, what's your name? What is it? I got Joe sitting right in front of me, okay? Joe's sitting here. Let's just say Joe lost a friend to cancer and he prayed and prayed and he cried and he prayed and he said, oh God, and he laid hands on his friend and his friend died. So Joe's sitting on his bed and Joe says, Lord, I need to know what's going on. I need you to father me. I need to understand. Look, I'm calm in my heart. I'm certainly not mad at you. You saved me. You forgave me of sins, but man, I don't get this healing thing and I don't know why Johnny wasn't healed and God, I need you to speak to me. That would be humble, right? Joe's sitting there and all of a sudden Jesus just shows up and just appears. He's standing right in front of you. And he says, Joe, it's just what you fail to see, bud. But truly, Joe, I tell you this. If you see what I see, you, Joe, will do what I do. And Joe, nothing will be impossible for you. However, not seeing like I see will never come out of your life unless you continue in fellowship and relationship with God through prayer and fasting so that the fullness of who he is becomes the full expression of Joe. (laughs) That's what that verse is saying. Now, you show me a limit. You show me a limit. If there's a critical person out there, I'll look past your criticism. You just show me a limit in this. It's a challenge. It's a little bit of a challenge right now. I'm sorry if I'm coming across wrong. It's just amazing how quick we just quick to speak, quick to speak. Assuredly, I tell you this. If you have faith, you will say to the mountain, not to God, to the mountain. Move and the mountain will, and nothing shall be impossible for you who sees. You show me a limit in that promise. You show me a, well, unless, of course, the person you're praying for doesn't have faith. Well, unless the person you're praying for has unconfessed sin. Well, unless the person you're praying for has unforgiveness in their life, that'll be a sure block to the power of this promise. You show me where it says any of that that we say in that promise. Because the kingdom follows the believer. And when we start writing books, 30 some reasons why men aren't healed, we are in trouble. Because if you embrace one of those reasons, you have a book in your back pocket that Jesus did not carry. And the only reason we wrote the book is because of our experience and it wasn't his, so he didn't need our manual. Are you guys okay? I know I come across a little intense. Some of this stuff needs attacked and pummeled. Because I've all week, all week, all week, I've been looking at you guys excited and in love with Jesus the best you know him. And we're destroyed for the lack of knowledge. We're not destroyed because we're hypocrites. We're destroyed because of the things we don't understand. And when you give me a mic and I'm looking at your faces, I'm bringing it this way. Are you hearing? And I'm not even asking you to agree. I'm asking you, you take what I'm saying and you find what I'm saying that's not in the book. And you see if your yell but can escape how solid this thing is. 
How's your yell but get around the scriptures I showed you? If every promise is yes, and there's promises for healing, is the will of God a yes concerning healing? If his disciples couldn't heal the boy, and that's happened to us, and Jesus healed him and only does the will of God, and says, if you see what I see, you'll do what I do, then we should be on a journey to see what he sees, not rewrite the book. Are you guys with me? Man, that's just solid preaching right there. I feel happy. I'm going to have to quit. Look, I don't have any more chance at you guys, so I won't close with this one line and I'm late. I'm so sorry. Tom, I really am sorry. Kind of. It's kind of a tough place. You're sorry, but you're not. You'd have to understand and be in my shoes. I'm sorry, but I'm not. Listen, the... the, the there was something else I was going to teach. I can't teach it now. I don't have time. But I just throw it out there. And it's on YouTube. You can check it out. Faith is not a tool. Only a tool. It's not limited. It is. It is in a sense a tool in your belt to get a prayer answered or to move a mountain. The primary use of faith in the New Testament isn't a tool to get a prayer answered. It's a perspective that you live by. That's why he puts the word the in front of faith over and over and over. The faith of the gospel. Contend for the faith. Established in the faith. Resisting. Standing steadfast in the faith. What he's saying is. Never lose sight of who you are. Now that he came and why. In the face of it all. Maintain faith. The just shall live by faith. Faith. Yeah? So watch. Would you agree that faith is a perspective when they put the word the in front of it? How can we all have the faith? Because we all wake up in the morning and believe we're created for his image and our goal is his love. So whether we have this gift or that gift, we all have the same motive and reason for being. That's what makes the body of Christ one. We all live for the same reason to be like him. That's the faith. So Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I, but it's not I who liveth. It's Christ living in me. And the life that I now live, I live by the faith, the perspective of the Son of God. I live by the view that made him tick. Who loved me and laid down his life for me. Follow me. You get it? Why don't you stand your feet? I want to pray over you guys. It's just a blessing. Would you please? I love you guys. Thanks for your hearts, your hunger. Going out there and loving people and continuing to live this way. Amen. Tom will have a real good, healthy session in the afternoon. Please come and pay attention. It's pastoral and it's healthy and it's good. So that things leave here clean and you guys steward what you've learned and grown in cleanly. Amen. So you don't take your hype and your zeal and push it on people. And, and use Todd's name or my name so much that if somebody hears our name one more time, they're going to just fall over and die. <sighs> You don't realize how people have done that stuff, man. I had lunch with a pastor, and we got to know each other and had a great time together. And he laughed and said, there was a time, there was so-and-so kept saying, Dan this and Dan that and Dan this. He said, I thought if I'd hear your name one more time, I was just going to scream. But he didn't even know me. He just saw that the person was too consumed with using my name. And it bothered the pastor. So don't do that. You don't sell stuff. You bear fruit. Amen? Amen. So just thank you. Love you. The, we were talking about in the back. The hunger here, the way you guys receive us as from the Lord and speaking in the Lord is humbling. It's amazing. You make such a draw on truth. Like people say, I preach good. I think it's your fault. You guys pull it out, man. Because you're right here wanting him. Amen. So don't let anything ever change that. If you're starting to feel discouraged about anything, it's a warning. Warning. Back up. Regroup. And move forward. Yeah. Not back up that way. But just whoa. Slow down. Why? Wow. That's got to be a lie. If what you're believing. And what you're thinking. Isn't producing life. Can't be the Lord. So you stay encouraged. The rest of your days. Will you?
Will you lift your hands to heaven with me? I want to pray over you. Father, I thank you for this house. I thank you for your people. I thank you for the army that I'm looking at. What an army. God, that's amazing. Yeah, we are definitely outdoing Gideon. This is amazing. Lord God, we just thank you that you're with us. You're in us. You're on us. You're through us. And we just look to you and there's things we've settled this weekend. You love us. We're not judged or condemned. You're not mad at us. You're with us. You're for us. You're fathering us. Yes, you're correcting us. You're not beating us. You're correcting us. You're instructing us. And we have ears and hearts to obey and follow and become everything you paid for. Keep teaching us, Lord. Keep giving us wisdom and discernment and understanding. And Holy Spirit, we welcome you into our lives. And we ask you to do in our lives what Jesus would if he was sitting in our car. Lord God, we just thank you for the kingdom. We thank you we're your sheep and we do hear your voice. And we rejoice in it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Love you guys.